Welcome back to Daily Reddit Stories. Let's start with the story. My father announced I wasn't his child at his anniversary party and kicked me out. Now, he wants back into my life after nine years. My relationship with my father had always been distant, but I never imagined it would become so painful. On his 20th wedding anniversary, he dropped a bombshell on me. He told me that I was not his child and kicked me out of the family. It was because he had found out that his ex-wife, my mother, had cheated on him. I was devastated by his words. How could he say such a thing? Did he really mean it? All my life, I had looked up to him as my father, my role model, my protector, but now he was rejecting me as his own. It felt like my world was crashing down around me. At the anniversary party, my father had gathered all of our relatives and friends to celebrate his marriage. As we all sat at the long dining table surrounded by festive decorations, he suddenly stood up and made his announcement. I remember the shocked silence that fell over the room as everyone looked at him in disbelief. I felt like I was in a nightmare, as if I was watching a movie and not living it. My father's words were like a knife to my heart, and I couldn't bear to be in the same room as him. So I got up from the table and ran out of the party, tears streaming down my face. Rushing to my mother's house, I couldn't hold back my tears. I told her what my father had said to me at his wedding anniversary party. My mother listened to me, holding me tight and reassuring me that everything would be okay. As I calmed down, my mother told me the truth about my biological father. She revealed that she hadn't cheated on my dad. I was, in fact, my father's biological daughter. She explained how hurtful it was to be accused of infidelity and how much pain my father's accusations had caused her. I felt both relieved and heartbroken at the same time. It was a relief to know that I was indeed my father's child but the fact that he had doubted my mother's faithfulness was painful to hear. It made me question everything I knew about my family. Despite the revelation, I couldn't bring myself to forgive my father for his hurtful words and actions. The pain he had caused was too much to bear, and I decided to distance myself from him and the rest of my family. As soon as I left my mother's house that day, I knew I had to start over. I felt completely alone and abandoned, but I was determined to make the most of my situation. I had to start from scratch, but I was determined to make a life for myself without my father's presence. I had to learn how to be self-sufficient and rely on myself. I worked hard every day and saved as much money as I could. I had to prioritize my expenses and cut out unnecessary things from my life. It wasn't glamorous, but it was necessary. In the beginning, it was tough to do this without my father's advice and support, but as time passed, I started to build a new life for myself. I met new people and made new friends who supported me through the tough times. I started to pursue my hobbies again and even discovered new ones. Without my father's presence, I learned to value the relationships I had with other people in my life. My friends and co-workers became my new family and I learned to cherish their love and support. I also started to see a therapist to work through my feelings of abandonment and rejection. It wasn't easy to talk about my pain, but it was necessary for my healing process. With the help of my therapist, I was able to work through my emotions and come to terms with my father's rejection. Despite the pain and heartache, I slowly started to realize that I didn't need my father's approval or acceptance to be happy. I was strong and independent, and I had built a life for myself that I was proud of. Years went by, and I continued to grow and flourish without my father's presence. I had accepted that he was never going to be a part of my life, and I was okay with that. I had my own family now, my friends, my therapist, and most importantly, myself. It wasn't until nine years later that my father reached out to me again, but by that time, I had already built a new life for myself. As I sat in my apartment staring at the phone in my hand, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. My father, the man who had kicked me out of his life so many years ago, was calling me. After all this time, he wanted to talk to me again. I didn't know what to feel. Part of me was angry, hurt, and confused. How could he just expect me to forgive and forget after everything he had done? But another part of me was curious. I had always wondered what it would be like to have my father back in my life, to have a real relationship with him. So I took a deep breath and answered the phone. His voice sounded different now, older and full of regret. He apologized for everything, for kicking me out of his life, and for the hurtful things he said to me. He explained that he had been going through a tough time back then, and he took it out on me. He never meant to hurt me. As he spoke, I felt a range of emotions. Part of me wanted to scream at him and hang up the phone, but another part of me wanted to forgive him. I wanted to believe that he was genuinely sorry and that he wanted to make things right. After talking for a while, we decided to meet up. I was hesitant at first, but I knew I needed to see him in person. Update 1 One week later, as I sat across from him in the coffee shop, I couldn't help but feel conflicted. That it had been years since I had seen my father, and now he was sitting here in front of me, looking remorseful and vulnerable. I didn't know what to say to him. He began by apologizing for what happened at his 25th wedding anniversary, but I cut him off. I told him how humiliated I felt when he announced to everyone that I wasn't his child, that I couldn't believe he could say something like that, especially in front of all those people. That I could see the pain in his eyes as he listened to me. He knew he had messed up, and I could tell he was genuinely sorry. But I wasn't ready to let him back into my life just yet. 
I needed to know that he was serious about making amends. I told him that if he wanted to be a part of my life again, it was going to take more than a simple apology. He would have to prove to me that he was committed to making things right. I couldn't just forgive and forget everything that had happened in the past. He nodded solemnly, and I could tell he understood. We talked for a while longer, catching up on each other's lives. I found out that he had divorced my stepmother and had been going through a tough time. I felt a pang of guilt for not being there for him during those years, but I knew that it was important for me to put myself first. As we said our goodbyes, he told me that he hoped we could reconnect in future. I didn't make any promises, but I knew that I was open to the possibility. Maybe, just maybe, we could rebuild our relationship and start anew, but it was going to take time and effort on both our parts. Update 2 4 months later. As time went on, my relationship with my father slowly improved. We began talking more frequently, and I even met with him a few more times. However, it wasn't until I heard from my mother that I knew something had truly changed in him. My mother told me that my father had reached out to her and apologized for his behavior. He admitted that he had been wrong to accuse her of cheating and abandoning me, and he expressed regret for the pain he had caused both of us. So my mother said that it was the first time in years that he had acknowledged his mistakes and taken responsibility for them. She was cautiously optimistic that he had truly changed, but she also cautioned me to take things slowly and be careful. I was happy to hear that my father had taken this step, but I was still wary. I had built a life for myself without him, and I wasn't sure that I wanted to let him back in so easily. It was going to take more than an apology for me to fully trust him again. My father continued to reach out to me and show that he was committed to making things right. He respected my boundaries and never pushed me to forgive him or spend time with him. Instead, he simply let me know that he was there for me if I ever needed him. NTA, the father's behavior was inexcusable. How could he kick his own child out of the family simply because he thought the child wasn't biologically his? He could have handled the situation with more maturity and empathy. Instead, he chose to react out of anger and hurt, which led to years of pain and separation. Even though he did eventually realize his mistake, it didn't take away from the fact that he hurt his own child in a deep and lasting way. I hope he realizes the gravity of his actions and works hard to make amends. The father's actions are absolutely disgraceful and completely unforgivable. To kick out your own child from the family simply because you suspect that their mother cheated on you is beyond shameful. It is an act of cruelty that no child should ever have to endure. The emotional pain and trauma the OP must have gone through is unimaginable. NTA, the father's behavior not only displays a complete lack of respect for his daughter, but it also shows a lack of empathy and compassion towards his ex-wife, whom he accused of infidelity without any concrete proof. Instead of talking to his ex-wife about his suspicions, he chose to make a spectacle out of it at his own wedding anniversary with his second wife, causing a scene and humiliating his own daughter in the process. It is clear that he was not ready to be a parent, and his actions prove that he was not mature enough to handle the responsibilities that come with raising a child. His decision to cut ties with his own flesh and blood is inexcusable, and even though he has now apologized, it is impossible to ignore the pain and trauma that he has inflicted on his daughter. In conclusion, the father's actions were selfish, cruel, and irresponsible. He may have realized the error of his ways, but he can never fully make up for the damage that he has caused. His daughter had to suffer for years because of his inability to be a responsible and loving parent, and that is something that should never be forgotten or forgiven. Next story. Me, 14, female. My twin sister Kate and our parents, 40s, live in a four-bedroom house. My parents have the master. The second room is a guest room. Dad uses the third room as an office, and my sister and I share the other room. The three regular bedrooms are small. Dad works from home two days a week, and we have guests maybe 10 days a year. I'm very outgoing. I like having people over, and Kate's an introvert who wants to watch her old TV shows and talk to her friends on Discord. She likes order, and I like putting my clothes on the chair without being yelled at. We've been asking to have our own room since we were nine, and my parents are refusing to move us because we don't have enough space for everybody's needs. Quarantine was awful. Kate and I fought all the time and our parents yelled at her when she moved her stuff to the guest room because mom has her craft stuff in the closet. And what if grandma had to stay with us for a while? I love my sister. But this is making me like her less, and sometimes I think she barely tolerates me because we're always in each other's space. We barely fit in here anymore. The closet is too small for our clothes. Kate's books are in stacks on the floor. I can't listen to music in peace, and my friends ask why we are sleeping in bunk beds in a four-bedroom house. Yesterday, I was looking for my hair curler and caused a book avalanche that knocked the USS Enterprise whatever off the desk. Kate was screaming. I was screaming, and she asked for the thousandth time to combine the guest room and the guest so she can take the other room. Dad said he absolutely needs an office. I said I absolutely need a closet, and it doesn't make sense to have all this space and put both his kids in a single room. Mom said we're not entitled to a bedroom each, and there are millions of children who share a room, and if we wanted more space, we should get rid of stuff and stop living like hoarders. Like we're sorry for being two separate people with two people's worth of belongings that you bought for us. 
I asked who is entitled to a room that's empty 346 days per year or an office that's used twice a week and why I'm the unreasonable one for wanting some space. After that, we were yelling in circles, and Kate took her laptop and locked herself in the guest room. Dad asked what she thinks she's doing, and she said googling nursing homes with bunk beds, which she did not at all. So, are we a holes? Today, my aunt and grandma visited and called us ungrateful for everything we have and were disappointed in us. I don't believe I'm an ass because I just am asking to use the space we already have, but at the end of the day, it's my parents' house, not mine. Kate and I wouldn't be angry if we lived in a two-bedroom house. But four bedrooms, the one room just sitting there, being a waste of square feet and taxes, and we have to share. NTA, but I laughed to tears about nursing homes with bunk beds. If my kids said that to me, I'd have a really hard time taking myself so seriously that I wouldn't fall over laughing. I do think a dedicated guest room and a dedicated office is a ridiculous waste when the family harmony would be drastically improved by separating children. My office is moving to the dining room because I can no longer use my daughter's closet as an office. She needs privacy and personal space. NTA, your parents, on the other hand, are prioritizing their own wants and needs over you and your twin. Sorry for the bum deal. Save up and move out as soon as you're old enough. You won't have to live like this forever just until you can pay your own rent. Next story, 24 male here talking about my 24 female Mara friend. They am organizing a birthday party at a bar in the city we live in for a mutual friend of ours. I rented out a portion of the bar with bottle service, so it cost about two grand. I'd a little over 20 people were invited, so I think each person paid around $80 to $90. I'm not quite sure what the number exactly was as people paid me a few weeks ago. Kimara was one of the people who paid me. She said something about misreading the dates, and she has some big thing with her sister that night, and she could not attend. Say so the fight we are having is Mara wants her money back. Well, she can't have her money back. So why? Because I already paid. Essentially, I would have to give her the money out of my own pocket to refund her. I currently live on my own, which I pay for pretty much all my bills, but my parents still send me a little bit of fun money a month. Not much like 200 bucks. This is honestly how I paid my share of the bar. Mara knows this. She's been bad-mouthing me, calling me mommy's money and shit. She's accusing me of being a spoiled, selfish prick, because I know she's worked for pretty much everything since high school and the money means a lot more to her than it does to me, I guess. I don't think my situation matters at all, and that is just extra details. Her poor planning is not my problem and just because technically I can afford to pay her doesn't mean I should. At the end of the day, she paid for it and didn't realize her schedule in conflict and that's on her. The last comment I had to her was, if you claim you work so hard, maybe go to work and make your money back instead of trying to shake down your friend and we haven't talked since. Edit. Other thought about refunding. Like wouldn't me refunding her now set the precedent that if anyone else had an issue, I'd now have to refund them too. Because I guess I must make this clear, I told everyone two days in advance that I would be paying the bar. Everyone said it was chill. Many are claiming the good friend would give her the money out of their pocket. Look, she's not like a best friend of mine. Not really someone I need to bend over backwards for. She's more the friend of a friend and we are friends through that. NTA. She should have checked her dates before confirming and handing over the money. I think it was pretty obvious that the total was being split between attendees. So, if she wants her money back, are you supposed to ask the other 18 or so for $5 extra? Are there any other friends who didn't make the guest list who you could ask in her place? Then they could pay her portion and you could pass the money back. Next story, Ada for dropping of my employer's kids at her important meeting, TA as my main is linked to me, and I have received clients through it. I was an au pair before, and now I provide nanny services and annual babysitting services. A new contract is signed every year, there are no run-on contracts. I have three others working for me and the occasional team looking to make some extra cash. So one of my employees was done with a minor celebrity family abroad. This celebrity had recommended her to one of their run celebrity friends. I had a few families that weren't vetted on a list, but because she said she already knew the social circle, she wanted to start immediately due to cash flow and was willing to start before the formalities and paperwork was sorted out. The contract with base rate, extras, and holidays and all were signed and agreed upon before she started. Apart from some minor disagreements, her former celebrity employer was overall a good client, so I allowed her to start thinking their friend wouldn't be a hassle without betting them. The first week went okay, and I got good feedback from her when I touched base with her. The second week there were some minor disagreements. The third week they didn't serve her food because they felt she was getting paid enough to get her own food. I contacted them and gave them a warning that they couldn't breach the contract and to reimburse her cost of food. They agreed to it, but the day after my employee contacted me and said they gave her what they thought she should use for food instead of her actual costs and she wanted to quit. I contacted them again and told them that there would be legal action if they didn't. They did begrudgingly but left a voicemail wondering why she felt the need to eat papayas and pineapples. Even though this is part of the children's diet, 
and as per the contract she would get the same food and other fancy stuff when she couldn't afford it. They also said people like her should stick to what is within the means of their budget. So I moved her out this placement and came to an agreement that I would take over her duties until I found them a different one. This is in line with the contract. It's my responsibility if a nanny is sick or otherwise not able to do the job, not the parents. The children were not the best behaved, but due to their ages, I let it slide. Things got bad for me during the fourth week as it was my weekend off. So when I woke up, she had written me a note taped to my bedroom door that she was gone for the weekend and that I should help her out this once as I had given her a faulty nanny to begin with. So it was in line with her character from what I had observed, but I was still shocked that she would pull this after me explaining the contract before taking over. I let it slide. When she returned, she came back with her husband. I sat them both down and told them that during my days off which they would be informed about minimum 14 days prior as per contract, they had to arrange their own childcare. In addition, I reminded them that as they had now been given two warnings, the third would void the contract. Wick was in the contract, so they tried to raise objections, but I reminded them that I was an employee, not a slave. Six weeks from then, which was yesterday, I was supposed to have the weekend off. When I woke up in the morning, the house was empty apart from the children, the bearded dragon, the duck, and the other animals. So if even Chef wasn't there, the note she had left stated that she was out entertaining her friends and co-workers at the beach, and that she would be back by two. She said she would really appreciate it if I could do it just once more, as it was an important get-together. The children were more or less old enough to take care of themselves, so it wasn't a hard job. Two came and went, and no sign of either one of them. By four, I had left several messages. By five, their other celebrity friend came by to pick up some of his stuff that he had left behind a few days earlier. He mentioned a restaurant and handed me a 20 telling me to hang on in there, as it was an important appointment. Then I crashed her important meeting with a surprise and telling her the contract was voided and to expect a solicitor to contact them since last evening both her and her husband have left. Um, unsavory messages on my phone. Next story, I, 27F, am marrying my fiancé, 29M, in a traditional Indian wedding. My sister, Sarah, 25F, is having a Christian wedding around the same time. Sarah asked me to tone down my wedding, postpone it or make it a fully Christian ceremony to avoid overshadowing hers and to reduce family stress. I've been planning my dream wedding for over a year, and changing it now would be a huge inconvenience and financial burden. Despite understanding her concerns, I refused her request, leading to accusations of selfishness and threats from my mother to boycott my wedding. Am I wrong for standing my ground to have the wedding I've always wanted? Sarah asked if I could either tone down my wedding, consider postponing it, or even make it a fully Christian ceremony to balance things out. She believes that having two weddings so close together, with one being significantly grander, would take attention away from hers and create unnecessary stress for our family, who will have to juggle both events. I told her that I understand her concerns, but I've been planning this wedding for over a year, and it means a lot to me to have it the way I've always imagined. I also pointed out that our cultural backgrounds are different, and both weddings will be special in their own ways. Additionally, postponing my wedding would be a huge inconvenience and financial burden for us, given the extensive preparations and bookings already in place. Our wedding dates are three weeks apart. We have separate guest lists, but there is some overlap with close family and mutual friends. My mother is siding with Sarah and believes I should change my wedding to a fully Christian ceremony, or at least incorporate significant Christian elements. My father, on the other hand, supports my decision and believes that both of us should have the weddings we want. Sarah was very upset and accused me of being selfish and not caring about her feelings. Thanks for watching till the end. Wishing you an awesome day. Feel free to drop a comment if you've got more to share. I'd love to hear from you.